All right, welcome. So today we're going to calculate pi to 1 million decimal places. Why? Well, we're not doing it because it's hard, and we're not doing it because it is impressive. We're doing it because it sounds like it's hard and it sounds like it's impressive, but it really isn't, at least not anymore. So to figure out why, let's go over a bit of history. Back at the dawn of recorded history, maybe 4,000 years ago, they knew pi to zero or maybe one decimal place. And that's probably about as good as you could do today with a ruler, a good compass, a steady hand, and some string. At around 250 BC, Archimedes used shape approximations to get pi between 3.1408 and 3.1429, so that's about two decimal places of accuracy. In 1665, Sir Isaac Newton got to 16 decimal places. Yes, I know 16 decimal places wasn't the record for 1665. That happens to belong to Christoph Greenberger, who had 38 decimals. But although Christoph was a reasonably successful astronomer, at least according to Wikipedia, he certainly isn't well known today. So anyway, Isaac Newton, the all-around genius everyone has heard of, had 16 decimals in 1665. That steadily increased, and around 1706, John Mackin developed a formula for pi that let him calculate 100 decimal places. That's the formula we're going to be using today. Yes, I know you haven't heard of John Mackin either, but since we're using his formula, he gets a shout out. They broke 1,000 decimals by 1950, and they got to 1 million decimals just after 1970. Billions and trillions of decimals were cracked soon after, and as of today, the world record stands at 50 trillion decimals. So let's just go ahead and throw away all discussion of trillions and billions of decimals, because we won't be doing that. We're going for 1 million decimals and beating what they had in 1970. So if I'm using a 300 year old formula, how am I going to get so many more digits than much more impressive mathematicians like Archimedes, Euler, or Isaac Newton? Well, I've got one thing they don't have. I've got a mediocre computer that I bought for $400 in 2019. I should note here that I work for Google, but this is a personal video, so all opinions here are my own. First, let's take a quick look at how Archimedes got pi. It's 250 BC. We don't have an equation to find pi. Curved shapes of all kinds remain difficult but we do know how to find the perimeter of an object with straight lines. So what we do is we take a circle and put it inside of a square. Then we put a second square inside that circle. If the circle has a diameter of one, then the outer square has a perimeter of four. The inner square has a perimeter of 2.82. Since the perimeter of this circle is pi, we know that 2.82 is less than pi and is, that is less than four. This isn't a great approximation. As I said, it's not as good as you could do with a ruler. But we don't have to use squares. We could use more sides, such as six sides or eight sides. Honestly, I'd make more sides here, but they got annoying to draw. Archimedes got up to 96 sides, but we have eight. So let's just be happy with that. Putting pi inside two octagons tells us that pi is greater than 3.06 and it's less than 3.31. We could keep going with this. But instead, let's just jump forward to 1706 and use an equation that's faster and easier to program in the computer. After all, Archimedes didn't even have decimals and had to do all his work with fractions. So there's no need to limit ourselves to equations from 2000 years ago when we have brand new equations from 300 years ago. This is the equation that will allow us to get to pi. This gives us the inverse tangent of an angle x by adding an infinite number of terms. If we pick an x less than one, then each of those terms is smaller than the previous one. Once each term is small enough, we just stop and get pi. This equation for an arctangent is called a Taylor expansion, and it was discovered after Newton invented calculus in the late 1600s. I won't go into detail about how this equation was derived, and not only because I don't actually know how. But to use this equation, we need to write pi as a function of an arctangent of an angle. So what we need to do is find an angle that we know the tangent of, even though we don't know pi. As it happens, pi divided by 4 is such an angle. Since the circle is 360 degrees, and the circle is also 2 pi radians, then pi divided by 4 is 45 degrees. We know that the tangent of 45 degrees is equal to 1, and more importantly, we can prove it even though we don't know pi. So since the tangent of pi over 4 is equal to 1, we know that pi is equal to 4 times the arctangent of 1. We can plug 1 in for our arctangent equation to find pi. I mean, we could do that, and the equation is technically correct, but is also complete and utter garbage. The reason this equation is garbage is that it converges to pi extremely slowly. We need to start with a number smaller than one to take advantage of the exponent term in the arctangent equation and converge to pi much faster. This is the equation that John Mackin developed in 1706. It converges much faster because he, 
found the arctangent of 1 fifth, so that every subsequent term is 25 times smaller than the previous term. Let's try to get our own equation for pi that's better than pi equals 4 times the arctangent of 1. We need to start with an angle, and we could use literally any number less than 1, but let's just start with 1 fifth. We also need to use a trig identity. Do you remember those trig identities from high school, the ones you don't remember? This is one of those. This identity is for finding the tangent of angle alpha minus angle beta. We take this identity and put in pi divided by 4 for beta and 1 for the tangent of pi over 4. Then we put in 1 fifth for the tangent of alpha. A little bit of work with fractions tells us that the tangent of alpha minus pi over 4 is negative 4 sixths. We take the inverse tangent of both sides and rearrange the equations. Then, since tangent alpha equals 1 fifth, we know that alpha equals the arctangent of 1 fifth. Finally, this gives us an equation for pi. It will converge much faster than our equation with an arctangent of 1, but it's still not as fast as Mackin's equation. What Mackin did was similar to what we just did, but instead of a single trig identity for one angle subtracted from another, he also used an identity to find twice an angle. So let's just take his equation and start coding. All right, this is the program that I wrote to use Mackin's equation to calculate pi. It's pretty short, only about 40 to 50 lines of actual code, plus some comments, empty lines, and fluff. The programming language that I used was Go, not for any particular reason, other than it's a language I'm trying to get better at. How it works is that I have a function to calculate the arctangent of a number and return a float64 value. Then I have a section that calls that arctangent function for 1 fifth and 1 239th and sums those values with the appropriate ratios. Just for fun, I have also hard-coded pi to 200 digits that I pulled off the internet. And I have the program set up to print out the pi that we calculate versus the real pi one digit at a time. So let's do that. Well, perhaps you see the same problem that I do. Our pi versus the real pi match up to 14 decimals. And after that, they're different. Looking back at history, 14 decimals is about how many they knew back in 1400. So it's not that impressive. Truthfully, I expected something like this to happen. The reason it's happening is that I'm using a 64-bit floating point number for the math. I may not be the best program in the world, but I do know that you can't fit 1 million decimal digits into a 64-bit binary number. It takes just over 3 binary bits per decimal digit. So we might expect that the 64-bit number would hold 20 or so digits of pi. We got 14 digits of accuracy, so I'm not exactly so sure why we didn't get 20 or so, why what happened to the other 6 digits, but we probably lost some accuracy in the math and holding the sign. If we want to do better, then we need a type of variable that can hold more precision. Ideally, one where we can set an arbitrarily high level of precision to hold. Go happens to have a package like this. It's called big. So I'm going to rewrite this program using a big type floating point number. All right, so I did that. It's basically the same, except the big numbers had some of their own ways of implementing addition, division, and multiplication. But we still have a function for arctangent, which we are calling a couple of times, multiplying by a constant and adding together to get pi. I already tested this up to 1,000 digits and found it to be accurate. But instead of just running it with 1 million digits, I set it to start at 1,000 digits and run multiple times, doubling the number of digits it calculates each time. It also prints out the last 10 digits is calculated and the time it took to calculate that many digits. So let's go ahead and run this now. All right, so it got 8,000 digits pretty fast, and 16,000 digits took about four seconds. 32,000 digits took over 20 seconds, so that isn't good. Let's put this in a spreadsheet and see what is happening. We can see that each time we double the number of digits, it's taking four, almost five times longer than the previous number of digits. Estimating this forward would make me think that it would take us almost two days to get pi to one million digits. It might be longer than that though, because not only is the time getting slower, the ratio is getting worse. So the next double might take longer than five times the previous one. So we could let this program run for two days, but I think it will probably be faster to find a way to speed up this program. The issue, I think, is with the big float. Since we need to keep millions of bits of precision for every single term in our equation, it is slowing everything down. We can probably use big integer to speed this up. Hopefully, 
I can do that in less than two days. I got it to work with integer math, and it is definitely faster. Here's what we are doing. We have this arctangent equation. If we were using floating point numbers, we would get this for our first three terms. We already saw that it works, but it's too slow. So let's say that we want to keep 20 digits of pi. To use integers, what we will do is multiply each of those terms by 10 to the 20th power. As a result, instead of 3.1415 plus some more digits, we would get 3.1415 to the 20th power. At the end of all the math, we switch back the floating points and divide by 10 to the 20th. If we want to keep 100,000 digits of pi, we use 10 to the 100,000th power instead of 10 to the 20th. We can run the pi calculation through our time loop again and look at how long it takes. We can get up to 16,000 digits almost instantly. And 64,000 digits takes only around 5 seconds. For 64,000 digits, that's over 20 times faster than when we were doing floating point numbers. Even more importantly, if we look at the ratios of each double, it is steady at a factor of 4, not 5 or worse. This means that we can project it out and expect that it will take about 20 minutes to get 1 million decimals of pi. So I'm going to set it to calculate 1 million decimals and let this run. What we get is that the last 10 digits of the first million are 577-945-8151. We did it. We beat 1970. It took us 20 minutes of running the program plus a couple days of writing the program. Since it took about 20 minutes to get 1 million decimals, and every double of digits gets 4 times longer, that means we could expect 10 million digits to take 100 times longer, which is around 2,000 minutes or 33 hours. So it's conceivable we could run this, and 10 million digits would get us past 1982, but we're not going to do it right now. If we wanted to get into the hundreds of millions, or billions, or more, we would need to find a different algorithm or some way to seriously speed this one up. But for this video, we're done, so thanks for watching.